Hello everyone. In the next three days, we are going to look at the initial approach to a neonate with respiratory distress. This is our team from Jubilee Mission Medical College who will be discussing with you the various scenarios in the next three days. We would initially look at the overview of approach to a neonate with respiratory distress, go on to the pulmonary physiology, the etiology of distress, little bit about initial evaluation and monitoring, and then how do we target oxygen levels. Uh, and then we go on to the introduction of treating these babies. Well, the first question that you're going to ask when you see a baby is, is this baby well or sick? Because the whole approach uh, that you're going to follow thereafter is going to depend on this question. If it's a well-looking baby, still you would do stops. What is stops? Yes, you must be remembering. In the third module, this was discussed in detail when, you, uh, when we discussed in the initial evaluation of a sick baby. So you have here five parameters the sensorium of the baby, is the baby lethargic or active? Is the baby hypothermic or euthermic? Uh, what is the oxygenation level? Is the baby cyanotic? Is the baby desaturating? What is the perfusion level? You would remember the test that was discussed, the capillary filling time, etc., etc. And then you also you would like to know whether the sugars are normal or not, or is the baby hypoglycemic? So having evaluated the stops, when the scoring is good, you can be reassured. All the parameters, sensorium is good, euthermic baby, does not require much of heater output to maintain the temperature, the oxygenation levels are quite good, the perfusion is good, sugars are normal. Well, this is a well baby who needs to be with the mother, keep the baby warm with the mother and breastfeed. Suppose the scores are poor, this could be a sick baby. And he, this is where your problem starts. The moment you suspect that the baby is sick, first question that you're going to ask is, is this baby going to crash now? Any pre-arrest condition can cause problem for you. So if you the, the, the need answers, the three things that you're going to ask is, is the baby breathing? If the baby is not breathing or having seizures or bleeding, probably this could be dangerous. So these are sick babies who need to be attended to in a different way. So we would have a, a separate module on uh, emergency management of these babies. But if the baby does not have pre-arrest conditions, but you are not very sure whether the baby is well or sick. So, and you assessed your uh, stops and you found that stops is poor, well, then the next question that you are going to ask is, is the baby having respiratory distress? Why? Because respiratory distress is the most common manifestation of a sick baby. So until you are sure about this, you would not go any further. This again, uh, I believe was discussed in the third module, how to assess. We will just have a recap of that. Uh, so the, when you see a baby, the first question you're going to ask is, is this baby having respiratory distress? Let's see here. I hope the audio is clear for you. What is the sound that you're hearing? There is a grunt, grunting, audible grunt. Baby has retractions. And this is probably a baby with respiratory distress. There is no doubt about this. Baby has been just brought and you're connected. And these are your values. We will discuss further on this case in the subsequent part of the module, but let's go on with our uh, discussion right now on the approach. So, well, the baby that we saw was, it was very obvious that the baby was having respiratory distress. So you would immediately initiate CPAP or if the baby has any pre arrest condition, probably you would even intubate and give invasive ventilation. But if we are not very sure, like this case, if we are not very sure, but baby seems to be sick, you need to really look at some other scoring system, which is that, that again we have learned in the module three, 
the two mold, uh, scoring systems that you would use at this point are the Downey's scoring system or the Silverman Anderson scoring system. Downey's scoring system for all the babies, mostly in the term babies, where a preterm babies, if you are, uh, have the SAS, if you know how to assess by Silverman, Silverman Anderson scoring system, you can use that one. And then you are going to differentiate whether is this baby, suppose is having uh, poor stops, is it having poor oxygenation or poor ventilation? Well, oxygenation problem always manifests as desaturation or cyanosis. And here the treatment is oxygen. Whereas if, here, you are, uh, if you really uh, are interested to know more, the uh, oxygenation problem does not uh, depend on lung alone. It depends on the other organs like the heart, the uh, blood, the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood and other things. Whereas the ventilation problem is purely lung problem where you're washing out of uh, CO2 is what is going to tell us whether the ventilation is perfect or not. These babies usually manifest with retractions and poor Downey score or Silverman Anderson score. So these are the babies whom you would need to put on CPAP or some form of ventilation. Well, uh, now I would invite uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Uh, Bimal Vincent, uh, assistant professor in my department, to continue with this lecture. Welcome to this NNF nurses training program. In this module, we will discuss initial management of a baby with a respiratory distress. So this topic will be dealt under the following headings. We will talk about some key aspects of pulmonary physiology. Then we'll discuss about the causes of respiratory distress, then how to evaluate a baby with respiratory distress, how to monitor respiratory distress, then also about oxygen targeting and oxygen therapy in newborn ICU. So talking about pulmonary physiology, ventilation is a key aspect in pulmonary physiology. This is the process in which air moves in and out of the respiratory system. As you all know, our lungs is like a distended balloon inside the thoracic cavity and the diaphragm is a key muscle of the respiratory system and it acts like a piston and when it, when it contracts, the air, air enters the lungs and when it relaxes, it pushes the air out of the lungs. Oxygenation is another aspect of pulmonary physiology you know that every cell requires oxygen for metabolism and for the production of energy. So oxygenation is the process in which oxygen is delivered to the cells and it involves, of course, ventilation because oxygen has to reach inside the lungs. And what is more important is alveolar ventilation because it is in the alveolar ventilation that part of uh, respiratory bronchioles and alveoli that actual gas exchange takes place. And after ventilation, there should be adequate gas exchange between the air in the alveoli and the blood in the pulmonary capillaries across the alveolar capillary membrane. And once this gas exchange takes place, the blood has to carry uh, the oxygen to the distant cells. And it's done by the hemoglobin. So hemoglobin content is very important in oxygenation and again this has to be delivered to the cells and for that there should be adequate cardiac output and perfusion so for adequate oxygenation you should have adequate ventilation gas exchange oxygen transport and oxygen delivery now another key aspect is the functional residual capacity this is the amount of air that remains in the lungs at the end of normal tidal respiration so this is the act that volume of air inside the lungs that actively takes part in gas exchange. And it decreases in conditions where alveoli collapses at the end of expiration. So if you can use modalities that can distend or expand the closed alveoli, we can increase oxygenation. So increasing the functional residual capacity increases oxygenation. Now compliance. Compliance is the distensibility of the lungs. It measures the change in volume when there is change in pressure. And in newborns, 
the uh, there is low lung complaint, especially in preterm babies, and when the babies are born, immediately the lung complaints may be poor, so they the lungs may not be stiff. But at the same time, uh, the chest wall complaints is very high, so they have uh, chest retractions much more common than pediatric or adult patients. So modalities which can stabilize the chest wall can increase the ventilation. Now let's speak about some of the few common causes of respiratory distress. Respiratory distress syndrome is one of the most common causes of respiratory distress in level three NICU where a lot of preterm babies are cared for. Now this is caused by the surfactant deficiency in premature lungs. So uh, when the gestational age decreases, the uh, respiratory distress syndrome, instead of the respiratory distress syndrome, increases. Now, transient tachypnea of newborn is uh, uh, another common cause, especially in level two NICU, where more late preterm or early term babies are cared for. This is mainly because of uh, increased fluid in the lungs, uh, especially seen in babies born through cesarean section. Pneumonia is again a very important cause uh, of respiratory distress in newborn. Seen in mothers with infection and chorea meningitis, the mothers present with fever and leaking PV. Meconia aspiration syndrome, again a cause of respiratory distress, especially the causes pulmonary high pulmonary pressures and they present with the uh, severe oxygenation failure. Congenital cardiac malformations can also present as respiratory distress. So you have to keep in mind that it is not uh, the respiratory distress, not the manifestation of only the respiratory system. Even cardiac condition can also present with respiratory distress, especially in condition congenital cardiac malformations where the pulmonary uh, circulation is high. They can present with respiratory distress, and also cardiac failure when there is pulmonary condition can also present with respiratory. Distress. Spontaneous pneumothorax, though a very rare reason, condition, but uh, you have to keep it in mind, can also cause uh, respiratory distress. Persistent pulmonary hypertension, again, uh, uh, cause a severe, can cause severe of oxygenation failure and present as respiratory distress. Pulmonary hemorrhage also can present with respiratory distress and also diaphragmatic hernia. Uh, this is due to anatomical defect in the diaphragm, the, there's a defect in the diaphragm and the intestinal contents herniates into the lungs and this can also present at the time of birth with respiratory distress. Now how to clinically assess a baby in respiratory distress? Usually they present with tachypnea, that is a respiratory rate of more than 60 per minute. Now one thing you have to keep in mind is that newborns, unlike pediatric or adult patients, they don't breathe in a regular rhythm. They breathe, their rate of breathing is different. So when you take a, a one minute time, in the first 15 seconds, they may breathe fast, like 20, 20 breaths in the first 15 seconds. But the next 15 seconds, they may not breathe at all. They may or may breathe only four to five times. So if you take 15 seconds and multiply it by four, you may get a wrong, uh, may not be the right respiratory rate. So you have to ideally count the respiratory rate for full one minute. Another symptom of respiratory distress is grunting. Grunting is a mechanism of the baby to increase the functional residual capacity. So it is an expiratory sound and it appears in the beginning of the respiration and it, the baby tries to expire with a closed glottis. As a result, the pressure inside the lungs increases when the, all the closed alveoli expands, they open up, and that will increase the functional respiratory capacity. So this is baby's attempt to increase the functional respiratory capacity. Strider is an inspiratory sound and uh, most commonly it is seen in uh, congenital laryngomalacia. So you have to look for these sounds when the babies have respiratory distress. And grunting means that uh, baby's lungs condition, when it is audible without stethoscope, 
the condition of the lens is very severe so he might require a, more, a higher modality of treatment retractions so as i said before chest retractions are common as predictable because their lung compliance is very high so uh, this also i will talk about grading of the retractions the more the severe the condition the more will be the chest retractions and uh, we can uh, see uh, subcostal retractions intercostal retraction and suprasternal retractions cyanosis again is a feature of respiratory distress when the oxygenation is affected so there are you know that there are two types of cyanosis acral cyanosis and central cyanosis acral cyanosis can be due to hypothermia or even at the time of birth soon after birth acral cyanosis can be quite normal but central cyanosis is always pathology and when the baby is present with central cyanosis that means their hemoglobin saturation is low oxygen is affected and these babies require immediate care now pulse oximetry is a very effective method in assessing the oxygenation of a baby so it measures the saturation of the percentage of hemoglobin saturation how does it measure the saturation it measures the differences in the rates of light absorption between oxygenated hemoglobin and reduced hemoglobin in the red and infrared regions of the light spectrum the oxygenated red and uh, oxygenated hemoglobin absorb more more of infrared light and reduced hemoglobin absorb more of the red light so this difference they calculate and with from that they interpret the hemoglobin saturation it's a very effective method and it uh, measures the percentile component of the uh, body that is the arterial we we'll get the arterial oxygen content because it measures the arterial blood hemoglobin saturation but in condition in which the circulation is poor or there's poor position when there's uh, there's no uh, pulse volume is low it can give wrong results so that can be that should be kept in mind nevertheless it's a very accurate method very effective method in measuring the saturation uh, hemoglobin saturation now there are scoring systems to objectively evaluate respiratory distress one such scoring system is down score in down score we assess five parameters uh, cyanosis retraction entry air entry and respiratory rate and the severe the condition the greater the grading the baby will get so in cyanosis if the baby is maintaining saturation normal saturation no cyanosis in room air uh, he will be graded as zero when uh, he has um, uh, no cyanosis with fao2 of less than 40% that is yes cyanosis in room air or saturation is low in room air but with fao2 is less than 40% he is able to maintain saturation that means a grade one and if he is not uh, or is only able to maintain a saturation of a normal saturation with fao2 of greater than 40% that means is grading is getting a grade of 2 retraction and there's no retraction and is normal to zero mild retraction one and moderate to severe retraction will be two grinding uh, when there is no grinding uh, there is uh, the grade will be zero when the uh, grinding is audible only with stethoscope you will get a grade of one and if the grinding is even audible without stethoscope you will get a grade of two errandry again if it is normal zero delay or mildly reduced one and barely audible it will be two a spread rate normal spread rate that is less than 60 that is it gives a grading of zero 60 to 80 one and more than 82 now down score is mainly used for tame babies but you can always use it for preterm babies and it's a um, easier method of uh, scoring the annual scoring system is anderson silverman anderson retractor scoring it's mainly used for preterm babies we assess the upper chest, lower chest, sepoid retraction, nasal flaring, and expiratory grid. In upper chest uh, assessment, you have to assess the baby from the side. You have to assess the rise of abdomen and the chest. Usually, the chest and abdomen during inspiration rises at the same time. But in mild respiratory distress, the abdomen rises and there is a lag of rise in chest rise there is a lag in chest rise the abdomen rise first and after a fraction of second the chest also will rise so 
In those babies with mild respiratory disorder, they will get a grading of 1. And in when there is severe respiratory disorder, when the compliance of the lungs is severely affected, or there is area of obstruction, there will be CSO respiration. That is, the abdomen rises first. At the time when the abdomen rises, the chest actually goes down. And when the, when the chest comes to the normal position, abdomen goes down. That is called CSO respiration. That means this respiratory disease is severe. Now, low chest retraction is mainly the intercostal retractions. Uh, if it is normal, it will get a grade of zero. But if there is mild retraction or just visible, you will get a grade of one. And severe intercostal retraction, you will get a grade of two. Sifoid retraction also similarly, if it is uh, just visible one, if it is uh, the severe just uh, in the cost of retraction, uh, you will get a score of two. Nasal flaring, uh, minimal nasal flaring uh, is graded as one, and uh, marked nasal flaring graded as two. Expiratory gland is uh, similar to Downey scoring when it is audible only with cystoscope one, and if it is audible with our naked ears, it will be two. Now, let us objectively evaluate a baby. Uh, with this scoring, down is let's do down is scoring in a baby. So you can see in this video, now about the management of uh, spread distress, it depends on the etiology and the severity. Depending on the severity, you will have to use higher modalities of treatment. Now, oxygen therapy in NICU is a very important aspect in the management of respiratory distress. So, you know, all know that it's the most common drug used in uh, NICU. And just like any other drug, it has, if, if we increase if the amount of oxygen delivered is high, which is more than what is needed by the baby, it can even cause toxicity. So it's just like any other drug, the excess use can cause toxicity. So we have to be very careful when you use oxygen in the NIC. Now I will talk about uh, some of the sources of oxygen that we use in our NIC. If you are working in a level three NIC, you will be getting central piped gas. That is, oxygen will be coming through from a central source, liquid oxygen in a central source, and it's be coming to you through oxygen pipes. Then, uh, if you are uh, uh, working in a level two in ICU, uh, you may be having oxygen cylinders. Again, it is a liquid oxygen, and that we delivered from the uh, oxygen cylinder to oxygen tubes. Then we have oxygen con concentrator. They use the atmospheric air and then uh, concentrate oxygen from the atmospheric air. This can also be used in resource poor settings. How to adjust concentration of oxygen? As I mentioned just now, the concentration of oxygen that you give is very important. You should not give more oxygen, it can be toxic to the baby. So you have to give the ideal concentration that, that is required for the baby. For that, we can use air oxygen blenders. Uh, in um, level three and you have to use air oxygen blenders. Uh, it's quite expensive, so in the resource poor setting, it may not be feasible to use air oxygen blenders and the uh, one method of giving uh, different oxygen concentrations when you remit but this is more, more commonly used in pediatric and adult age group because they it's used when you use face masks and in newborn babies you don't usually uh, use face masks so it's not used in the newborn another way of giving graded oxygenation is by using an air oxygen graph this is a very uh, good method, especially in resource poor settings uh, where a blender is not available. For this, you should have a compressed air source and a compressed oxygen source. Oxygen should be coming under pressure. I will talk about how to give in the latest slide how to use the air oxygen graph to give greater amount of oxygen. Now, this is an oxygen blender. Uh, you should need a compressed air and oxygen. Uh, to give uh, various concentration of oxygen. Now, this is the air oxygen graph. From uh, this graph, you can find that by varying the flow of the oxygen and 
the compressed air, you can give various concentration of oxygen. For example, if you keep an oxygen uh, flow of one and the air flow of say seven, you will be giving around 30 percent of oxygen. So I, by varying the amount of flow of oxygen and the compressed air, you can give varying concentration of oxygen. And how to give, how to use this air oxygen graph? So for that, you have, you need a white connector. And at one opening, you will connect the compressed air. The other opening, you will connect the oxygen. And this opening will be connected to the oxygen canner. So when you give oxygen, you have to give humidified, heated humidified oxygen if possible. Or if you are using it as a low flow device, you can even use humidified, just humidified oxygen. And uh, this is oxygen canola, so that uh, the third opening should be connected to this, and you can give oxygen through canola, and you can uh, vary the change the flow of air and the oxygen, and give uh, oxygen under different concentration as is required. This is the uh, humidifying chamber. So humidification is a very important aspect when you give oxygen. The oxygen, especially the centralized oxygen or the oxygen coming from the cylinder, oxygen cylinder, they are coming under a really low temperature, even four degrees or even low, lower than four degrees Celsius. So if you give this oxygen directly to the baby, it can affect the respiratory epithelium, it can thicken the secretions, it can lead to infections, and uh, the condition, the whatever the respiratory distress condition is, it can it can deteriorate. So you should always humidify uh, the oxygen that you give. So ideally it should be heated and humidified. This humidifier can heat it and humidify the uh, oxygen. So heating actually helps in humidification. The warm hair can hold more water vapor. So heating is a me me uh, mechanism of increasing the temperature of the air and also increasing the water vapor content of the air. So when, whenever you are using especially ventilators, CPAP, uh, high flow devices like that, you should always use heated humidified oxygen. Now, there are humidifiers where the air is not heated, just humidified. So this is an unheated bubble humidifier. Uh, this is useful when you give uh, oxygen when it is uh, low flow oxygen. That is when the flow of oxygen is less than one liter per minute. You can use unheated public humidifiers. But when you are giving high flow oxygen, like more than one liter per minute, always give heated humidified oxygen. Now we'll speak about the oxygen delivery devices. It can be classified under two headings. One is the low flow devices. So in these devices, we use oxygen. Uh, the flow rate will be always less one liter per minute or less than one liter. So the nasal prongs and cannula, uh, they are delivered through the nasal prongs and cannula. High flow devices is the, in these devices, we use oxygen at a higher rate, higher flow, like more than one liter per minute. Examples are the high flow nasal cannula and the CPAP. Now, the advantage of giving oxygen through nasal prongs. Uh, so uh, as I said earlier, the maximum flow rate when used as a flow device is one liter per minute. Uh, the FIA2 delivered in the nasal prongs depends on oxygen concentration, flow through the nasal prongs, the cannula size related to the nostrils. So the cannula uh, size is more, more oxygen is delivered. And also the weight of the baby. If the baby is of greater weight, and uh, this baby will be able to take a greater tidal volume. So their saturation, oxygen saturation will be more, and oxygen concentration that they receive is more. Whereas a preterm low birth weight baby will be taking lower tidal volume and the oxygen delivery will be less. So it depends on the weight of the baby. So, so many factors can affect the FA2 delivered to these babies through nasal prongs. Now, this is a graph showing uh, on the y axis, this is the hypopharyngeal oxygen FIO2, hypopharyngeal FIO2. And here is a flow used in the uh, nasal cannula. So you can see that the flow use is very really low. The maximum flow we, the use is one liter per minute. So it's a very really low flow system. And we are measuring the hypophangeal 
FAO2 of these babies who is re receiving different concentration of oxygen from room air, 21% to 100% oxygen. You can see that even when you give 100% oxygen, the baby is receiving uh, the hypophyteal nasal uh, FAO2 is only around 65. So you cannot give 100% oxygen through this system. But it's a very effective system in uh, treating uh, mild to moderate respiratory distress because we can use, we can give graded concentration. Instead of giving 100% oxygen, we can always give a graded uh, amount of the, whatever is required, you can give through the system. Okay, so actually we have to combine this graph with the other air oxygen graph that I mentioned before, where the, uh, we use that white connector and by adjusting the uh, flow, we can actually adjust the uh, just concentration of oxygen we are delivered. And fr uh, from this graph, we can roughly calculate the hypophagial FAO, the oxygen FAO that the baby is actually getting. Okay, what is the advantage of giving oxygen through nasal cannula? The advantage is that it's helpful in feeding. We can feed the baby with the low flow nasal cannula in the nose and also uh, very uh, comfortable when giving claims. Disadvantage it can give inadvertent P. We are not measuring the P, we don't know the pressure delivered. It can give an inadvertent P. And effective delivery is unreliable. As I said, that there are a lot of factors that affect uh, the effective delivery. The, from the weight of the baby to the concentration of the oxygen delivered can uh, deliver, it can affect the effective delivery. Now, head box is another very effective method of giving oxygen to newborn babies. Uh, the FIO2 in end box uh, depends on the size of the end box, position of the lid, and the flow rate. So I will just we'll go to the head box. Like, there are two ports in a head box, uh, one on either sides. So if the, both the ports are open, then the baby will be getting around a, if you have of 30 percent one of the port is closed it is be around 60 percent and both the ports closed it will give around 90 percent and the flow rate we have to keep the flow rate and the flow rate is cal calculated uh, by the weight of the baby uh, i will show how uh, how the flow rate is calculated it is four into minute volume so minute volume you have to calculate for each baby a 3 kg baby breathing at 70 per minute. And we calculate the tidal volume, consider the tidal volume as 5 ml per kg. This baby will be, this uh, baby's minute volume will be 3 into 5 into 70, that is around 1 liter. So 4 into minute volume will be around 4.2 liters per minute. So this baby should at least give, you should give 4 to 5 liters per minute. The problem is that if you don't give adequate flow, the carbon dioxide wash, wash out, the expiratory air will not get washed out. So you'll be breathing more of uh, expiratory air that is more in carbon dioxide. So there will be CO2 retention. So you have to make sure that the flow rate is adequate. It should be more than what is calculated by this method. Uh, advantages of head box. It's a very simple method of uh, giving oxygen. And uh, there's no risk of gastric distension, no inadvertent peep. Requires no humidification, that's a very uh, major advantage. There was precise FIO2. We will know almost what FIO2 the baby is getting from this uh, through food box. Well tolerated by term babies. That's an, another very uh, efficient method of giving oxygen to term babies who will fight nasal cannulas. So you can use food box. The head box delivers higher and more precise concentration of oxygen. And nasal prongs delivers lower and variable <coughs> concentration of oxygen, but better in terms of mobility and speed. So in uh, term babies, they will uh, tolerate head box better. Uh, Preterm babies will tolerate nasal prongs better. Now the WHO recommends uh, in resource poor settings a nasal cannula because head box requires a larger quantity of oxygen. Uh, as I said, we are setting a rate of maybe more than four or five liters per minute. But at uh, uh, the same time, nasal prongs requires only one liter per minute uh, when we use it uh, low flow. So unnecessarily, we may use more oxygen in head box. So 
WHO recommends, especially in resource poor setting, uh, nasal cannula work and headphones. Now we will talk about oxygen targeting. So it is very important to target the oxygen uh, saturation because, as I said, uh, said earlier, oxygen can cause toxicity and excess oxygen can cause toxicity. Now, why? Uh, what are the concerns when we give more oxygen? What happens if the baby requires more oxygen than the baby needs? Uh, the main concern is when there is more oxygen, the chance of retinopathy of prematurity is high, the BPD is high, the duration of hospital stay increases, studies have shown that, the workload and cost increases, oxygen is a costly drug, so you have to use it carefully. Long term outcomes is also not good when you use uh, very high oxygen concentration, I mean, when we target very high oxygen saturations. And what happens if you don't give adequate oxygen? Oxygen, when whenever there is need, you have to give oxygen because oxygen is very important for the functioning of the cells. So hypoxia can also affect uh, the baby. So it increases mortality because hypoxic brain injury, uh, increases incidence of NEC, long-term neurological outcome is also not good when we when we do not give oxygen adequate. Now, the main problem with oxygen, excess oxygen, is that it creates reactive oxygen species. And it occurs when, when we give hyperoxia, when there is oxygen amount, such an amount is more. It can also occur when there is hypoxia. And the more problem is when there is fluctuation. When we give more oxygen, then again uh, the baby uh, goes into hypoxia, then hyperoxia. If there is fluctuation in the oxygen uh, saturation, can be, uh, can produce more oxygen species. So we have to be very careful to maintain the saturation at the same uh, in the fixed uh, range. And the problem with the newborn babies, they're immature in, uh, their anti-oxidation system is immature. So they may not be able to deal with this oxygen spe species, radicals, that is generated by uh, this oxygen hypoxia. Now, what should be the oxygen that we should target in NAC? As I said, uh, we have to measure the saturation, hemolymphatic saturation through the pulse oximeter, by the pulse oximeter, uh, when you give oxygen. So the target oxygen in preterm babies should be 90 to 95%. And term babies receiving oxygen, we can target uh, saturation between 92 to 96. And in term babies who are not getting oxygen, uh, we expect a saturation of 94 to 98. So this is a uh, brief description about uh, oxygen targeting in NICU and uh, in this module I hope you have got an idea about how to manage babies with the uh, initial initially managed babies with the respiratory distress. Now in the coming days we will be giving you scenarios and asking you to interact so please interact and please free to ask any doubts regarding this session. Thank you.